Uh, we end today on a subject I think we're going to be talking a lot about, and it's been morphing uh, of, of late, uh, and that is the second screen experience. Ted, come on up with the, where are you? <laughs> come on up with your panel. Um, the, uh, we already saw, saw yesterday Jason Kinn tell us about the, uh, the, the massive uh, um, second screening of, uh, of the Super Bowl uh, that occurred just on, just on his platform. But I think one of the interesting things about the second screen is that we're starting to see uh, a, a, not, a frag, not a fragmentation so much as a realization of the diversity of second screen experiences that are going on. I mean, after all, second screening started before anybody was, was exploiting it. People were, asked, my, my daughter was, asked, was sending me SMS messages during the early seasons of Mad Men uh, during every scene uh, and, and you know, essentially creating a one-to-one -one, um, experience. My, my mother and my grandmother used to be, I used to come home in the afternoons and, and see my mother on the phone watching a soap opera with my grandmother on the other side of the phone watching the same soap opera, conversing with one another. I mean, it was early, I mean, it was early one to one communications across, you know, you, you know leverage, leveraging that second screen effect. Um, and, but we're also starting to see how Twitter constitutes one format, um, some, some of the, uh, the dedicated, um, uh, dedicated second screen apps, of course, individual apps that are, that are focused on individual shows and even on networks. There's a tremendous amount of diversity in the kinds of interactivity that's going to be going on, and I'm sure we're going to see even more, more innovation in the ways in which the second screen is used to activate experiences in the same way uh, we've been waiting for ITV to do for a decade now, um, but, but also things like M M Commerce that I think are going to be really strong in this space. To take the, uh, the lead in discussing the second screen, we have Ted, I hope I'm, I'm ho you just told me the, the pronunciation and I, and I already missed it. Boza? Close. Okay. <laughs> Close uh, enough. Uh, Ted is, uh, <laughs> Ted is with, with Moxie Interactive where he's the VP and account director. He manages the, Veri the, um, uh, the Verizon Internet Sales account, uh, but before that he helped start the mobile practice at St. Pete and Nitro, uh, has worked with scores of brands over the years. Please welcome Ted. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Uh, Ted Buzort is the way to pronounce it. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I won't, I won't expect anybody to remember that. Um, so, great topic uh, on second screening. It's, it's something that, uh, you know, as Steve mentioned, something that kind of organically popped up and it's, it's, it's getting some legs, but it's still very new. And um, to help explore this content, um, but the panel here, and I'll let, the, I'll let them introduce themselves. Um, so, Dave, you want to start? Sure. Hey guys, uh, Dave Kaplan, um, VP of Research at Bravo, which is part of NBC Universal and now Comcast officially. Um, I I basically have sort of two a dual role, I guess, at Bravo. One is that I interface really closely with advertisers and their agency partners to kind of help them assess the efficacy of all of their efforts on our network, and that's inclusive of television, of course, but also cross-platform, online, mobile, tablet efforts as well, to really kind of help them evaluate. Um, ultimately what they're getting through an investment with our network um, and how to really optimize that as part of it. Uh, and then also I work very closely with um, the business side at Bravo to help us kind of figure out everything related to, you know, the sort of current business model, uh, revenue streams, um, and really sort of helping us forge our path moving forward because television, as you guys, as we've been talking about and as we'll talk about more today, is very much evolving and changing and what kind of worked you know, years past isn't working as well for us now, so we need to kind of figure out where we go forward. And so they frequently turn to me and research to kind of help guide that. So it's a really sort of data-backed decision, and that's something that's really great about Bravo specifically, is that research is kind of part and parcel of all of our decisions uh, that we make um, in terms of the future of our, of our, of our business. Uh, and that's basically it. So I won't, I won't give you too much of a reintroduction <laughs> again, but um, so I come from Dynamic Logic, Millward Brown, and what I think is great about um, the work we do and how it applies to some of this stuff is Millward Brown Dynamic Logic is a research company. Um, Dynamic Logic, and I started at the very, very early days when, as those of you who have been at startups, when your office is so small that you want to invite people to meet you at other places small. Um, and I think what's unique about us is that we're a technology company too, because so much of so many of these challenges that we'll be confronted with when we talk about multi-screen, when we talk about how are we really tracking where people are from 
um, in the mobile space. They're not just research challenges and media challenges, but there's also technology behind it, right? Can we build the appropriate tagging? Do we have the right way to make sure we know where people are coming from and to serve them with the right things? And so I think the technology aspect to it, hopefully I'll be able to voice some of that, but that is gonna be critical to how we can help understand how this new area is working. Wonderful. Um, my name is Carla Paschke, and I am the Director of Mobile Innovation at Engage, which is a digital agency with full service capabilities. Um, so with that in my current role, I'm actually seated within our digital innovation group, which I helped to found around four years ago, as we started to really see this transition into um, social and mobile from a, a convergence standpoint. Um, so within my day to day, I keep one foot grounded in mobile strategy for our clients, um, looking at best practices and how can we you know, bring best in class campaigns to lie for them. Um, but then the other foot is really rooted into the, you know, looking at what's one to three years ahead in terms of an innovation space. Um, so looking at startups, looking at partner opportunities, um, really trying to think through, you know, what is the next big thing that's going to be on the horizon? How can we start to prepare our clients for that? So I'll be giving the agency perspective um, on the panel today. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, as we started going down the prep for this panel, we, really, we quickly got hung up in definitions because what I define as social TV is completely different to what someone else might define as social TV, especially when you start crossing the borders between social TV, interactive TV, multi-screening transmedia. There's a whole bunch of buzzwords that get thrown out. So um, I thought it would be good for us to just start label setting in terms of what, what do we define as social TV versus interactive TV? Sorry, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I think at least at Bravo, we, I think everyone, everything kind of gets collectively bucketed into this sort of super, super category of, uh, of social TV. But then there's sort of different iterations of that that sort of go from there. So I think, um, I think on the surface, we might sort of think of social TV as something that connects back in some fashion to Facebook or Twitter. And that is very much kind of part of what we try to do as often as we can. And I think we were actually one of the first people kind of in that space trying to aggregate uh, you know, Twitter and Facebook into one kind of consolidated um, area of our of our of our online and mobile sites, so that consumers can really kind of have this this experience, this social experience with shows. But I think it's very much evolved kind of beyond that. Um, so I think interactive TV. We have this new thing, which I can talk about a bit, uh, called Play Live, where you're actually participating with the television program as it's happening, and that's a form of social TV. I mean, it's done not necessarily through Facebook or Twitter. It's done through your mobile through a mobile website or through an online website, but it enables you to kind of have real-time response into the show itself. Um, and then, of course, multi-screening is kind of part of all of this, because if it's, if it's social TV, then necessarily there's some other alternative device that you're using to kind of, um, to kind of uh, drive that experience. So I think it, it, kind of all, it kind of all fits under the social bucket, but there's different iterations of each. I guess it's like enhanced television. It's a, it's a good way to put it. Um, Jolene, do you want to share some thoughts? We had a pretty good discussion about this earlier. Um, I think you had some good points. Right, which is, which is this idea that um, <coughs> while those three things are bucketed together, they need to, with each of them, we need to really pause and think about why we would be using it with the particular audience we have in mind, right? So the advantage of the, the interactive TV, really, is this idea that it can completely collapse a purchase funnel, that you can see something. And when we mean TV, I think at this point, we have to acknowledge that that is both the TV screen, but that that's also going to apply to people who watch TV on their PCs or people who watch TV on their tablets. But it's this idea that you could have something, um, if you've all heard about what um, the Topshop Google, Google collaboration is, that I think it's launching tomorrow. Right? It's this idea that they're going to have a fashion show. And from that, watching that fashion show, anything that's shown in that fashion show, from the uh, music to the nail polish to the clothes that they're wearing, anything there is clickable and buyable. And I think what that has the potential, if it can be scaled correctly, to represent is perhaps the future of interactive TV. Great, thanks. So, Carla, your thoughts, how do we treat this space? Do, is, it, is it a new space? Is it a different space? Is it an extension of the, of the space? Talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. Um, so it is interesting when you start to kind of hone in on the consumer and what is the consumer trying to get out of their TV viewing, watching experience. You know, we are trying to move from, uh, you know, 
uh, a situation where it used to be very much a lean back space, and now um, as we're starting to introduce interactivity, it's much more becoming a lean forward experience, and how um, consumers can now interact with their devices um, in so many different ways. So there's definitely a tremendous opportunity for, for brands and for marketers to think about, you know, as people are connecting with their devices more and more in front of a, a primary screen, how do we start to get our message you know, into their hands? Um, you know, it's interesting when we start to look, there's a wide proliferation of, um, you know, second screen usage. But when we hone in a little bit deeper, what we find is that within that capacity, only around 22% of those experiences are actually complementary to what someone is seeing on the television screen. So this means that you have to really hone in on what is that value proposition that you are bringing to the consumer that's going to make them want to interact with your content as opposed to checking their email or playing a game or you know doing a random internet search, which are all um, second screen activities which we're seeing that may not necessarily be anyhow connected to what they're seeing on their primary screen. Um, so I definitely think there's a huge opportunity, but there's also some challenges in place for us today in terms of you know, how are we going to bridge that gap between um, getting them you know, interested in that particular content. Right, and I think to Carla's point, I think there's two interesting things that you mentioned there, right? Which is the behavioral pathway is already there. So a Google study showed that about 77% of people have um, their second screen device while they're watching TV. And in our study, we found that when it was a television ad done right, was it was an interesting television ad, 65% of people would follow up with that, had an experience where they followed up with that by going onto the mobile web, whether that was uh, going onto the website, downloading the app, uh, like the brand. Uh, so the pathway for the behavior is there. And there's some really fascinating technology that uh, we were talking about before, too. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, ZBox. Um, and they have a, a sync up technology, which is essentially an app um, that a user would keep open. And so the user would see perhaps a Volkswagen ad. And then they would be contemporaneously, but the idea I think is follow up there would be a Volkswagen ad that would pop up on their second screen device. So huge potential there, because we know what TV does right is the emotional engagement aspect, and what mobile does right is the utility aspect. So there's a huge potential to marry the two and really make a profound shift in um, marketing and purchasing behavior. Great, thanks. Um, Dave, from your perspective, talk a little bit about what type of devices are these, or, you know, you're seeing your, your customers using as a second screen device. Is it mainly tablets? Is it phones? Is it a combination? Yeah, and I think in the previous panel we were talking, someone had said that tablets are kind of surpassing, su surpassing smartphones and our focus should be on, on tablets as a result. I don't necessarily totally agree with that. I mean, I really think it depends on the content that we're putting forth to the consumer because it can vary wi wildly. Um, um, there's, you know, there's this thing, like I mentioned before, that we're doing called, called Play Live, and I think this is a good uh, chance to quickly just describe it. Um, basically what happens is, and we just launched it, previously on Bravo, you know, you could participate in polls or questions like which housewife is the hottest, or, you know, do you agree in, uh, in the fight between Teresa and Melissa, whose side are you on, that kind of thing, and we would typically put up the on-air question uh, during the commercial break, you could text in, and then later in the show, you would see the results of that of that particular um, poll. Now, what we've done is we've literally embedded this technology in our operations center at NBC Universal, so that now what happens is there's a driver on the screen that says, you know, who's hotter, uh, the, which housewife is hotter. You pick up your phone or your laptop or your tablet, and you could vote literally right then and there and see your responses fed into the on-air graphic like literally in real time so you you know and a lot of times it's linked into the sort of thread of the storyline that you're watching on air at the exact same time so it really kind of takes participation television to the next level now in the and we just launched this we did it in our late night talk show called watch what happens live it airs every night at 11 o'clock people are in wind down mode at that point their laptops are probably you know turn you know closed off at that point their tablets we think were even kind of closed off at that point but their smartphones were still by their side we saw that like 50 percent of the page views for uh, for um, play live were coming from smartphones and about 25 percent were coming from tablets that compares to six percent on average that we see for page views for coming from mobile for just our regular website on the whole okay but when you make something interactive when it's you know t when it's 11 o'clock at night 
And when it's short burst in nature, you're asking somebody to just simply and quickly respond to a poll question. You don't need to sort of launch a whole website to do that. You could do it pretty, pretty readily just through, um, through the app on your mobile phone, and that really is what drove the usage. So I think it, you know, it's about the right content at the right time, and I think that needs to dictate, ultimately, the device that's used and how we make that available. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to add, I mean, I couldn't agree more in terms of thinking through about those short bursts of content. Um, you know, one of the, you know, executions that I like to look at in, in the marketplace was for um, AMC and The Walking Dead and their story sync. Do we have any Walking Dead fans? A couple there, wonderful. Um, so what's interesting about, you know, AMC and how they've approached the second screen experience is they launched with a, um, a web platform as opposed to an application first. So as we start to get back to your question about you know, smartphones versus tablets, you know, they're able to responsibly go across the divide of smartphones and tablets to really maximize their reach. But kind of getting back to the content chunks, the um, you know, digital team actually worked with the riders to hone in on when do we want to serve up content within the live kind of portal of the show um, and then made those very small bursts of content. So for example, they have a um, gore meter, so you can rate something as barely bloody versus a bloodbath, and um, just very fun, short pieces of engagement that someone can go into, click what they think really quickly, and then get right back out. And it really made for a nice complimentary experience um, as you can go through these small polls, small questions, um, without missing the major moments on the television program. Great, thanks. Um, I, th I think key to this is, Jillian, um, what you mentioned in your, in your uh, spiel a little bit earlier, is, is the value exchange on the other end. Um, so really making it valuable for the user to actually want to engage on their tablet versus just reading email or whatever it is at the same time. Curious, um, this, I mean, potentially from a, you know, from a quote unquote TV watching perspective, this does compete with your attention. Um, so, so do you guys um, see this as a competing medium or an, or an Excel or is there a lot of opportunity there to, to kind of add to it? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, so we actually, we did this big study over the summer on this very topic of, of multi-screening and simultaneous usage. Uh, in our study, and I think it's been similarly cited from like the Googles, like 80% of people said that they you know use a device while they're watching television so this is like critical mass stuff we're talking about but the natural question we got from the advertising community and we were wondering quite frankly ourselves is okay so if you're putting people onto a second screen on their mobile device are they then ignoring the commercials as a result um we actually did not see that happen in fact we actually think it helped we, we observed two things one is that if you were second screening uh, on another device, you were less likely to fast forward through the commercials than you would have otherwise. 21% less likely to fast forward through the commercials. And what people were actually doing is they were audibly still kind of processing what they were hearing on television. In many cases, they were kind of looking up back at the television screen and then re-engaging with what they were doing on their mobile devices. And what we also found is that when the ad, and I think this is similar to what you were describing before from the, the sync up product, but when the ad on their mobile device, and we did this in a big lab, we, you know, we were able to jury rig it, so we served up the same ads on their mobile devices that they were seeing on television. When, the, when they were exposed on both television and mobile, their brand response was amplified considerably more than it was when they were solely exposed through television. So that 360 degree exposure really helped to kind of bolster the brand's impact. And so we, and we've seen this time and time again, is that when a consumer is exposed to a brand message across multiple platforms, it's much more effective than when they're solely exposed on television. And we see this time and time again. So we actually think that yes, consumers are moving in this direction in terms of usage, but it's actually of benefit to marketers because when a consumer sees your ad in multiple places, it just reinforces the message that much more. And I think to, to build on that, so the challenge to marketers, right, is that lots of times these um, marketing groups, at, whether it's at um, a brand or at an advertiser, they are separate from one another, right? So there's a digital group and a TV group, and there's not necessarily a recognition that you need to, in a very disciplined way, structure your offerings so that each one of them not only builds on the other, but also recognizes the inherent strength. So if a TV, the real value of it is really the emotional engagement, and uh, for a web ad, the real value is the ultimate utility at the bottom. How do you structure that experience so that you're taking your audience through all of that 
And don't do the opposite of that, which is essentially let's replicate it again and again and again. You need to make sure that each layer builds on each other going from the gross to the granular. No, that's a great point. Um, something that I'm focused more a little bit on the, on the commerce side of things. Um, so explore a little bit how you layer in, I don't even know what prefix you put to commerce on this, but um, D commerce, T commerce, M commerce, whatever you want to call it. How do you layer that into um, a second screen experience so that it's relevant? Yeah, so I mean, I, I know you referenced ZBox. So we, so Comcast, NBC Universal has made uh, an investment in ZBox, which is we're sort of talking about it as like second screen on, on steroids or you know TV sidekick, whatever you want to call it. And and we do have a lot of hope for it. It's you know I think one of the challenges in this space is that much in this you know before Hulu came along and you know video was available in lots of different places and then Hulu kind of consolidated it all in one place I think that's what Zbox is really attempting to do here so that you can get your second screen content for Bravo or AMC or TNT or NBC all in the same place and basically Zbox um, essentially has mo you know it tries to sort of meet all of your second screen needs in a one sort of dashboard like format of which part of that is t-commerce so for example american express which was one of the launch partners of this basically what would happen is there would be a driver on air you know in you know life after top chef which is a show on our air that sort of follows top chefs after they win the show and so there were products that were featured like cooking products that were featured in the show there would be a driver on air that says hey you can actually buy this if you launch your uh, zbox app sync your american express card i mean there's a couple of steps involved unfortunately but it's fairly frictionless in terms of the buy and then there's a section that would sort of enable you to actually purchase a product right then and there and we've seen some encouraging results come out of that so far it's just still in the early stages but it's the first time that we've made e-commerce sort of a reality. Yeah, I definitely see a lot of potential with Zbox as well. Um, in addition, we're starting to see other players um, look at how they can you know, bring t-commerce to their application. So for example, you know, eBay launched a watch with eBay application, which um, syncs up with your cable and then um, based upon the show that you're watching at that particular time, pulls in you know, inventory from the, the eBay store that you'd be able to purchase. So for example, if you're watching a sporting event, there might be a jersey. Um, if you're watching a soap opera, there might be a script. Um, I think I've even seen you know, Judge Judy, you had like a Judge Judy coffee cup or something that was available when you were looking at that programming. Um, you know, there's certainly its own limitations in regards to the actual supply of, 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 the, of you know, inventory that you're able to purchase. But what I think the, the bigger ramification is that you know, other you know, um, players in the space are looking at this commerce challenge, and I think we'll start to see some really creative solutions coming forth um, in the next uh, few years. Yeah, great. Um, one thing that's always interesting about these uh, new emerging technologies is, is, is measurements and KPIs. Um, so Janine, if you can just elaborate a little bit on what you've seen as KPIs on this. Uh, Sure. So as we know, the, the gold standard right now of KPIs in this space is sort of owning the, owning the conversation, right? What's happening on Facebook and what's happening on twi Twitter and measuring those. And I think that that's definitely important. It's definitely important to see that increase of conversation um, after exposure to that. But I also want to advocate for that just because you're measuring the buzz of something doesn't mean you can necessarily move away from the more traditional brand metrics, which is how advertisers measure themselves. It's still important to get your message across, and it's still important to build the favorable opinion of the brand. I think the challenge is actually in this, right? We have to do both, but it's also on the technology side. So this has been mentioned earlier, but heretofore, it's been very difficult to know where the exposure came from. And I think the challenge is to be able to track that exposure, whether it's across the online or tablet um, or TV, so that we can understand uh, the contribution that each of those is making. And I think what's made it so difficult is that in the mobile web, it's a little bit of the Wild West. Right? There's multiple um, ad servers. The standards aren't necessarily there. There's different devices that you're competing with. And the challenge is, um, though not quite as glamorous, being able to tag people so that you can track uh, their exposure to the advertising across multiple platforms. And this is something that we're working really hard in because we know it's the key in helping advertisers understand how they're doing is being able to, uh, to track that. So watch what we're coming out with in the next month or so, but we're, we're really working on that issue. Right. Uh, David, do you want to share a little bit about how about you measure success? 
Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, the KPI is obviously very near and dear to our heart. I mean, it depends on what we're trying to measure. I mean, second, you know, part of the sort of the second screen social experience is that we're moving towards a place where, you know, TV everywhere, where more of our sort of full episode content will be made available on mobile devices and tablets in particular. Um, and, you know, Nielsen admittedly is a little, you know, a little sort of behind the game still on this one in terms of tablet measurement, although I know that they are making inroads and in getting there. Um, but until, you know, the tablet is measured in the same way that sort of linear television is, it becomes challenging for us to sort of fully understand the value of that audience and ultimately, you know, get credit for what is occurring. So there's still inroads that need to be made there in terms of video content. But we've done we've done a lot on the on the sort of KPI side. I mean, we we did this big program called Transmedia last year around Top Chef, where basically um, a contestant would that's eliminated each week kind of reemerges in this companion web series, and it drives it sort of on air drives to digital, digital drives back to on air, and it kind of creates this this three sixty degree loop. And we partner with um, Miller Brown and Dynamic Logic to kind of understand the brand efficacy of that because agreed. It's still really important. I mean, I think everybody's like, how much did it sell? How much did it sell? But, you know, when you're talking about a long purchase cycle product like an auto, you know, it's still really important to kind of understand those upper funnel, mid funnel metrics. And because they're paying a premium to be part of a cross platform or multi screen extension, you know, we need to show that it's more valuable than just television alone. So a lot of your guys' data helped us do that. Um, and then we sort of carried it out as well, partnering with Nielsen on some um, more sort of lower funnel, purchase funnel oriented stuff as well, and um, a number of other providers to really kind of prove it out. But KPIs, yeah, in this space, I mean, there isn't a standard, so we're still stringing everything together, but I think we, we're a lot more advanced than we were before, at least. Right, great. Um, so switching gears a little bit, uh, talking about where do you guys think this space is heading? Um, so if we if we look at some relevant examples, you mentioned The Walking Dead earlier. Um, where do you guys see this going, um, Carla? Want to start? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I definitely see this as a game changer in regards to how we watch television. You know, as you look at some of the, you know, the big shifts in the past from you know DVRs and, and and time shifting to even using your remote control to be able to to shift your television. You know, I see more and more you know function coming to your mobile device, so your mobile phone can actually become your remote. You'll be able to you know have more control over you know when you watch content what you're watching and then in, in what context you're watching it in regards to you know, the, the experiences with other devices. So I definitely see um, huge potential in the future. I think the commerce space, as we touched on earlier, is going to be extremely significant as we look to, again, hit on you know, every marketer's dream is to be able to show the advertisement on TV and then have someone buy it immediately. And I think we're not that far away from getting there. Um, I think you know, we still need to connect the dots between some of the technologies, but um, I think we'll get there. I think it's exciting to be able to be a part of that. Um, just a few thoughts. Great. I think it really comes down to four concepts. Scalability, integration, the audience, and the measurement of it. Scalability, just because something works one time, right? Oreo was great for the Super Bowl. Can they scale it and make it work it again? Can they do that within a, within a cost that's defensible? Integration, can all the parts acknowledge each other? Audience, can you get people to open up their Zbox app and engage? And measurement, which is just because this is a spontane more spontaneous medium, doesn't mean we don't have to test it in advance. Doesn't need, mean we need to, don't need to understand how it did after. So I think those are the keys. Great, David. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's still I think it's there's still a lot of potential here. I mean, I think the latest stats coming out of Nielsen is that like a third of Twitter users are um, actually you know socializing about television while they watch. Clearly, there's more market here to ca to capture. So I think you know we've only seen the beginnings of this. Um, I think I think ease of use is is number one. We've done some research and we found that one of the sort of points of resistance for people that haven't adopted yet um, a social TV kind of um, as part of their consumer watching experience is is ease of use. Um, you know, they just perceive it to be too complicated, and we've admittedly made some of our things more complicated and layered than they probably need to be. So, and I think this goes back to some of the findings that you had from your research as well, just making things simpler. I mean, it seems easy, you know, of course, but we, we get inside our own heads and we end up complicating it. Um, and then, yeah, I think making the, con it's all about content in the end and making it compelling. The reason why we had so much success with that transmedia initiative I talked about is because it was kind of like must-see viewing. Like, if you didn't go online or to your mobile phone and watch this other piece of content, you were lost 
on the main show on television. It, it just didn't feel as complete. And so I think, you know, really making the content authentic and, and important and sort of um, paramount, I think that will drive ultimately more second screen viewing. The other piece I'll add as we start to talk about content, I couldn't agree more that content is at the core of what we're talking about here, is going to be content choice. So we heard yesterday, you know, in terms of the, the second screen Super Bowl experience, that users were able to um, have a choice at what type of additional views or feeds that they wanted to look at through the game. Um, so they were able to vote whether or not they wanted the camera to be pointed over here or over here. And then they were further able to be able to choose between, you know, this sky view or the sideline view. Um, those types of choices and giving users preferences, I think it's going to play you know, a really large role in terms of the evolution of content. Even when we look at something like the Masters app and you're able to set alerts to be able to um, be notified when your favorite players were teeing off. Those are things that are providing utility in the context of content, and I think we'll start to see a lot more of that um, as these you know, solutions that continue to, to grow. Yeah, great. Um, so we have time Steve. for questions. Are there... Uh, David, to you, is there, oh, go ahead. Hi, it's Sarah here from Nielsen. Awesome panel, Ted, really good. Um, I've got a question for, um, uh, oh, sorry, I'm blanking. Um, Dave, hey, Dave, Sarah. Dave, thank you. We used to work together, actually. I know, I know, yeah. you're alumni. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, uh, so just first I just w wanted to say, Nielsen's definitely aggressively running uphill with, the, um, with adding on those extra channels. You will see iPad measurement this year. Um, you'll see we're starting with uh, Microsoft's Xbox as well, you know, and smartphones, to really make sure that with programming distribution, it's recognized, I think, with the um, social um, TV ratings, with that Twitter partnership, it's gonna be really valuable, not only for yourselves, who are so active in that space, but we also, I was speaking with our AccuView um, gentleman, and it's gonna help, you know, some of the smaller channels as well. But my question Yeah, and, I, and just to that, I will yeah. say this. One thing, and I and I was at Nielsen prior to this, and and I, and I totally hear hear you that it's on the roadmap. And I will say this about Nielsen that it sometimes takes a little bit longer to get there than we would all like. But once you, once we get there, once you guys get there, it's usually the best in class in terms of the measurement. Um, so it takes a little longer, but once it happens, it's it's spot on. So that that's that's always a positive. Thank you. Hey, so we heard yesterday from Jason Kent from CBS. He um, showed us the Super Bowl um, simultaneous you know, activity that he had streaming as well as online. And um, we asked the question of how he um, worked with his advertisers to really show the value of that second engagement um, place. How are you doing it and do you feel you're doing it successfully across all screens? I remember when the internet rolled out um, with traditional newspaper or TV, they would almost value add in the online. Is that happening with mobile or are you deriving full value across them all? Um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's becoming, it's, it, I, I agree that at first it, it was sort of positioned as sort of added value so you kind of had to prove that it was, it was worth its, its place. And now I think because so much of our stuff is woven so closely together between traditional and emerging and digital media that we really truly are presenting it as like a total package. And we're not necessarily um, sort of um, decoupling all the different pieces. And we really are talking about it in terms of a package. Now, not in every case, some of the larger efforts in some cases where you know it's just sort of standard turnkey stuff that we're adding on. In those cases, it's more viewed as an extension. But for some of the bigger deals, yeah, it becomes something that's, that's really positioned as a multi-screen buy, and so we talk about it in those terms, very much so. How how are the um, how are the media companies reacting to that? The media companies, meaning the the agent. 
the buyers um f- favorably i mean the on the sort of we, we face challenges of course on the on the media buyer side in the sense that there's still silos there as well so the digital folks and the tv folks aren't always talking um as closely as as they'd like so we find ourselves in a position where we actually are to some degree are kind of helping to educate them as well you know what i mean so when we we try to sort of make it again as simple as possible so that the digital buyer can kind of understand how the interplay with television works and the tv buyer can vice versa understand the digital play with with digital so i think there's still a learning curve from that side as well but you know we're seeing again improvement there interesting i think we can wrap any uh, yeah sorry steve ted panel thanks very much thank you um we are uh we're going to have our final round tables uh let me 